I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar uh, from the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CISIAC. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Heartbleed, Making Online Security Popular with the Masses. My name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC. Uh, our presenter today is Mr. Aaron Grace, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Now, before we begin, a few comments. All the phones have been muted, uh, except for the presenters today. However, questions can be asked at any time during the presentation by entering them through either the Q&A or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. Uh, I will be monitoring questions, and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, copies of the slides will be available afterwards. If you would like a copy, please send me a request. Uh, my email address is on the screen now. Um, also, uh, we are recording this, um, this webinar, and so the video and audio will be posted, and we will uh, distribute a link once it is posted. Uh, to, to begin today's presentation, let me give a brief commercial overview about the CISIAC. Uh, as I've said before, please note my email address for any follow-up. Um, the CISIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions Incorporated, who I work for, and is funded through the Department of Defense's Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DDIC. Uh, the CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management for DTIC. Uh, please check out our website and, join, website and join our community of practice at www.thecisiac.com. Um, also join us on our LinkedIn discussion groups. I have two discussion groups going one called CISIAC Software Intensive Systems, and the other one is CISIAC Information Assurance. Uh, so now I'm gonna introduce our, our presenter. Um, Aaron Grace uh, is a former Air Force officer and civil servant with more than 10 years experience in Department of Defense Acquisition Program Management and Information Operations. His areas of op expertise include requirements analysis and generation, cybersecurity development and fielding, and intelligence support to cyber operations. He currently serves as a uh, cyber intelligence analyst for SRC's Intelligence and Information Systems Division. Uh, in this role, he is responsible for providing the corporation and its customers with timely threat analysis, cyber attack indications and warnings, and enterprise risk assessment. Aaron holds a bachelor's degree from Indiana University. So now I'll turn this presentation over to Aaron. So welcome, Aaron. Uh, thanks, Tom, and I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about this uh, topic today. hope everyone in the audience finds it useful. So we're going to go ahead and talk about a couple of things to, to queue it up. Uh, today we're going to talk about Heartbleed, a vulnerability that uh, back in early April uh, kind of hit the hit the news cycle and, and really captured a lot of attention because of how uh, extensive the vulnerability was and how um, potentially damaging the vulnerability was uh, and, and continues to be. And so we're going to go through uh, a couple of things. Um, first, I want to kind of set the tone um, and kind of, if you haven't heard about it, uh, according to statistics, most of you have. In fact, if you're on this call, uh, more than likely you've, you've heard the name at least, uh, maybe not know what it is. Um, but I think everyone should be concerned about it, and I'll, and I'll lay out a couple of instances here where um, the actual vulnerability was, uh, was exploited and uh, why that matters to most people. Um, when, the, when the news first hit, uh, for example, Yahoo, if you use their online webmail services, uh, they came out as, as a vulnerable, uh, using a vulnerable uh, version of the software. And what that means is um, anybody that uses that service, certainly their, their username and passwords were at risk. Um, and anything in their email, email inbox, any data, personal data that might reside there is, is certainly at risk as well. There were a couple of uh, instances where large companies were compromised uh, via their virtual private network interface. Um, hard to say what kind of data was stolen, but the fact that uh, attackers were able to get in certainly had access to anything on their servers. Uh, and then in Canada, you might have heard that a 19-year-old was arrested by uh, um, stealing data up there, the, the Canadian equivalent of Social security, uh, and Social security numbers and uh, tax data associated with uh, its citizens, and, and they kind of uh, tracked him down and arrested him. So 
that kind of data uh, hits home to a lot of us. Uh, so Aaron, uh, I'm sorry, yes. Aaron, this is Tom. Uh, I don't think your slides are advancing, by the way. I, I haven't begun yet, so. Oh, you haven't uh, begun yet. Okay. That, that, that explains it. it. No Thank problem. You. But but if I uh, say next slide here and, and nothing happens, yep. let me know. Okay. Uh, so what happened is uh, the kinds of data that are being stolen should should hit home to everybody, and, and, and that's a good reason why folks should listen up and, and care about this particular vulnerability. And, and we'll go through all the different topics uh, and, and instances where we can kind of protect ourselves. Um, a, a note about the scope of this briefing, uh, it's, it's not going to be as technical as some that are, are, are talked about on this venue, but um, the idea is, uh, as the title mentions, this opportunity comes around once about every two years, uh, really gets the public's attention, and so uh, we're going to kind of keep it at the lowest common denominator and talk about uh, and t talk about this vulnerability in terms of uh, non-technical um, mitigation factors. And so we'll advance to the first slide now. Hopefully that changed. Okay, so here's specifically what we're going to talk about. Uh, in order to queue things up for the vulnerability, we've got to kind of understand what the underlying uh, protocol is and, and how it's supposed to work. Uh, then we're going to talk about the software that actually implements the uh, encryption between uh, the average user's computer and the uh, server, be it a bank or uh, social media or some email that you don't want somebody eavesdropping on, how, how that actually is supposed to be kept secure. We're going to talk about that. Then we're going to talk about the vulnerability and specifically how things went wrong in that protocol that, that has been uh, used now for almost two years. Uh, then we're going to talk about the gotchas. Why is it so bad that uh, attackers and uh, average, average folks can go out there and, and read your information? The next thing we're going to talk about is uh, what can we do now to recover from uh, this vulnerability and how can we protect our information that is that has now uh, potentially been leaked whoever has the capabilities to do that. Um, and also, finally, now uh, getting to the point of the, the whole briefing, the light bulbs come on for a lot of average users, people that don't normally uh, listen when a new vulnerability hits or there's an exploit in the wild for Internet Explorer. Um, kind of goes over the head of a lot of people, but this one was so pervasive in the news that I think a lot of people are, are listening now. And it's a good opportunity uh, to go through some of the standard security principles that, uh, that may seem um, kind of cliche at this point for a lot of folks, but and we've got some new people listening perhaps, and, and it's never a bad time to go through best practices for security online. So we'll go through a couple of those things. Um, and that's what that last bullet uh, speaks to. It'll be some tips that you can kind of take with you and also some resources specific to Heartbleed. And uh, if you want to go do some extra research, uh, we'll have the links that you'll be able to do that. Okay, so the way the internet is supposed to work, when you contact your bank on your computer or you re uh, log into your email uh, or, so or social uh, networking site, Facebook and the like, um, those, those connections are supposed to be secure using a protocol called HTTPS. And you might notice in the URL uh, that the, the address pane on your browser it might be, you might see HTTPS uh, in green, or you might see a little lock symbol to indicate that the connection has been secured and that the traffic flowing across the wire is now encrypted. And that anybody that might be in between you, your computer and the bank, um, hopefully all they see is a bunch of uh, random characters that, that mean nothing to them. Now, the uh, the mechanism by which that is secured is called Secure Socket Layer. Uh, there's also a TLS. Uh, we won't go into a lot of the um, details of the cryptography, so we don't want to get wrapped around the axle on the specific math and, and algorithms and all that goes into that. We'll talk about the nine-step uh, encryption negotiation that happens that's, that's totally uh, passive to most folks when they reach out to their bank. It happens so quickly. Um, but I think in, in terms of the Heartbleed uh, vulnerability, it's important to know those steps as a foundation so we can see where, where it went, finally went wrong. Um, but again, I understand that uh, the specifics about SSL and TLS and, 
and the encryption is a, is a five-hour presentation all to its own, but we're not going to get into that that deep. Okay, so we're going to start off talking about the HTTPS SSL handshake and the, the nine steps that are um, traversed to establish that secure connection. That's again, passive, uh, passively accomplished for uh, the average user. You don't know what happens. In fact, you just look up uh, a second or two go by um, if you have a slow connection and you see that the, uh, the lock symbol is locked and, and you have some assurance there. Um, so uh, the first four steps uh, involve creating a pre-master secret. Uh, your computer reaches out to the, to the server, be it the bank or the social media, and it says, uh, here's the algorithm, algorithms, encryption algorithms that I support, um, and here's a random number that you can use in your computation. And the server responds, okay, here's what we're going to use uh, for the encryptography, and uh, here's a random number for you, and here's my certificate. The SSL certificate is basically uh, an ID that uh, gives your browser uh, an assurance that it's talking to the right, uh, the right server, and it's not some rogue uh, attacker out there trying to spoof the end, the endpoint. So your computer says, okay, I, I recognize the SSL certificate. Uh, within that is a public key that I can use to encrypt uh, a piece of information and send it back to you. And then you, you, the the end user, the or the uh, the bank's server, only has a private key that it can uh, decrypt. And this private key is is important to to remember where it resi resides there on the server. The only place it resides is supposed to be on that server, and it is used to encrypt the communication between uh, that server and its endpoint users. And so that all that culminates in the creation of a pre-master secret key. So that uh, pre-master secret key is used on both ends to compute a master secret using the random numbers that were selected and the pre-master secret and the algorithms that were selected um, for the cryptography. And they're separately commuted, computed by both uh, your client and the server. And that gives uh, both sides a, a starting point in order to complete the, the transaction, as you'll see. So the final four steps involve the use of that uh, separately computed master secret. The client will take that master secret and create a hash. That's another mathematical algorithm uh, that it, it comp computes uh, a hash and sends it back to the server. The server will compare it to the hash that it, that it makes, again, testing out the, that the master secret is uh, shared. If it wasn't, if there was some uh, problem that would not be able to um, the, the comparison between the hashes would not match up, and so they would have to restart the, the negotiation. So while well, everything goes well, the hashes match, the server sends back a hash of the message, and the comparison takes place on the client, and if that matches, then they have a uh, shared master secret. They're confident that uh, they can encrypt the data that they want to send using that master secret, and that, the, that both sides will be able to decrypt the traffic and um, the communication between them will be will be uh, secure. Okay, so that is uh, the foundation for uh, how encrypted uh, or secure traffic uh, passes from one uh, end user to a server. And OpenSSL is a piece of software that implements that uh, protocol. It was, the project was founded in 1998. Uh, it consists of 11 members. Ten of them were volunteers, so there was only one full-time full paid uh, member of the team. And it operates on less than a million dollars a year. Most of that is donations. Um, as you can imagine, it's open source, so uh, that usually translates to um, a very good price, usually free. And so uptake is usually pretty high. Uh, as a result, uh, in 2014, uh, SSL was used on open SSL was used on about two thirds of web servers throughout the internet, and that uh, also includes things like uh, VPNs and, and uh, web email servers, uh, 
So it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. And, and, and so uh, you can see there that version 1.01 was released in March 2012. And that date is important because, uh, as we'll see, version 1.01 was the first release to include the heartbeat functionality that is the heart of uh, this vulnerability. Uh, the latest version was released uh, sub subversion G on 7 April 2014, and that's key because that's the first release post heart bleed that is actually fixed. And uh, if you're running that version, you are secure. Uh, you're safe from this particular vulnerability. So the way that the heartbeat is supposed to work um, with an open SSL, um, there is a, it was designed to be a keep alive function. So when two, we go through the nine steps that we just talked about <clears throat> to set up a, a secure uh, encrypted session between a, an end user and a server, uh, inevitably there's going to be some downtime between there. And so in order to keep that connection alive, um, they came up with a way and proposed a way to send a message every now and then to say, hey, are you still there? And the server would respond with, yes, I'm still there. Well, there's a specific mechanism they use to do that, and we'll talk about that in the next uh, couple of slides here um, that will show in a very basic way. In fact, it's in all the heart bleed um, briefings that you'll find out there, this this, I call it a comic. This uh, diagram is uh, is a requirement for for all of these, evidently because it's in all of them. And I think it's good because it succinctly tells the story about what the what the vulnerability is. Um, specific heartbeat starts out with uh, a heartbeat request. So your client, think about your computer connected to uh, your banking uh, institution. Uh, there's some downtime there. Every now and then in the background. It's uh, transparent to the end user because it just happens uh, on the wire. Uh, you'll send a heartbeat request to the server, and then uh, the server will respond with, yes, I'm still here. And the idea is to avoid having to renegotiate those nine steps and save computing time. Uh, so here's a, a little diagram to illustrate how that, typically, that works in a non-technical way. So picture yourself on the left uh, trying to access your bank server. Uh, you say, all right, so the, at this point, the encryption is already in place. There's some downtime. You say, server, are you still there? If so, if so reply these six letters, potato. The server says, user wants these six letters, potato. And it responds, potato. Uh, and this gives the client an assurance that uh, the computer, the, the end user, the server is still online and we're still connected. We have a secure connection. And that neget, uh, negates the need to renegotiate uh, the, encrypted, uh, the encrypted communication link. All right, so saving computing cycles, as any good uh, computer scientist would do, is always finding ways to uh, streamline their code and make it more efficient. It sounds like a good idea at the time. Um, but then uh, what happened was in April 2014, um, uh, one of the worst vulnerabilities in, in several years hit the, hit the public and had such sensational headlines as the ones you see here. Uh, I personally thought it was um, uh, as bad as they said it was, knowing that OpenSSL is out there on, on two-thirds of uh, internet devices throughout the internet and, and you know, gives kind of a, a free reign for an attacker to come in and take whatever they want uh, in an unlogged, uh, unrecorded way from, on, from the, uh, the administration's perspective. And we'll go into that a little bit too. Okay, so what is Heartbleed specifically? It's the serious flaw implemented in uh, the TLS TDLS heartbeat functionality that we just talked about. Uh, it's been merged into OpenSSL version 1.01a through f. Remember we talked and said that G is uh, repaired or fixed, patched. 
and is caused by a lack of a validation of the user supplied data, it blindly trusts that potato is six letters from going back to our diagram and it's not, not three or 16. So uh, it doesn't do any bounds checking. It trusts that the end user says uh, whatever the input is and the link match without checking. And so this leaves a door open for uh, remote sampling of data that's contained on that, end, uh, that server's uh, memory. And we'll talk about why that's bad. And here's a diagram to show how the Heartbleed, um, Heartbleed bug can be exploited. So now the, the user on the left says, server, are you still there? If so, reply, hat. Um, normally, it would, it would be three letters, but it can be manipulated to be any length up to 64 kilobytes. And so he says 500 letters. And then the server responds, okay, user Meg wants these 500 letters, hat. Well, hat's only three, but it doesn't check that it's only three. It just it grabs the first 500 characters from memory and supplies that back to the, to the requestor. As you can see, that could be a bad thing depending on what private information is on that server's, in, in that server's memory at the time. So why is this bad? The Harpley vulnerability, uh, as we've said, allows for remote attackers to sample the memory from a remote server's uh, contents at, in chunks of 64K. And so, you know, the worst part is this activity is not natively logged. And so an end user or a, or a malicious attacker could continually uh, sample from the memory of a, an in, a server until it gets um, various things like the private keys we mentioned that are used to establish the, the secure connection. And the reason that's bad is any attacker in, in possession of the private keys can then go back and decrypt any kind of any traffic that has been saved or, or uh, even in real time decrypt the traffic that's going on between a client and the, the end server. And so any time you can think about com uh, transactions with your bank, you're passing the uh, account numbers, usernames and passwords for your bank. Anything that would be uh, private, obviously you wouldn't want out there for anybody to get and decrypt. And so that, uh, the private keys are, are the foundation of that encrypted, encrypted channel. You wouldn't want those uh, to get out. Obviously usernames and passwords, e emails, accounts. Uh, there were, when this vulnerability first hit, Yahoo uh, got the brunt of it because uh, for the most part, uh, Gmail and Facebook and, and most of the other popular Google sites uh, were, were not vulnerable to this, but Yahoo Mail was, and on Twitter there, were, there was a flurry of, of folks uh, tweeting out uh, snippets of what they were able to get off the mail servers. Uh, username and passwords were common, and, uh, and session cookies was an, were another uh, big thing that folks were, were saying they got, and so uh, the reason that's bad, if you can, uh, again, uh, a cookie is, is a in the, in the most general term, it is a placeholder for a connection. So if you, uh, for an example, if you ever log into your Gmail or Webmail and then close it out and then come back a little while later and access the site again, obviously it, it won't make you log in again. You just kind of go in there. It's using that cookie that it's stored on your computer as uh, authentication. Well, you wouldn't want those stolen because then somebody can come in and masquerade as you and log into your account. And those cookies, in addition to residing on your computer, reside on the, uh, the server, so in the memory, and they're able to steal those as well. That was demonstrated. Um, and again, the worst part, this activity is not logged on the server side normally. Uh, so folks weren't, they didn't know that this was happening. So we've talked a lot about the vulnerability to the server. What about the client? What about your computer? Well, it is a two-way street. So uh, if it was a malicious, malicious server, you were enticed via phishing. Maybe you got a link in their email and you were able to go and access a server that the attacker uh, controlled. That attacker would then be able to issue keep alive notices to your computer and see the contents of uh, your computer's memory. Again. Um, 
usernames and passwords, cookies, private keys, all that stuff is, is stored on your computer as well. And the good news with that is most of the, the common browsers that people use, Safari and Chrome and Firefox, all of those uh, typically are uh, not vulnerable. So that it's not as, uh, not as big a problem as the server side that most people talk about. But there, is, there are some uh, client side applications that are uh, vulnerable. Most of them aren't ubiquitously used. And so it's not been a bigger, uh, as big a problem. And again, the, the proof of concept code is widely available. If you've ever heard of Metasploit, uh, there are modules in Metasploit that make it so easy uh, to use this, uh, to exploit this vulnerability. Um, the, the bar is really low. So uh, in terms of risk to an organization, the, the threat is uh, widespread and the, the ability of an attacker to, to pull it off is, is relatively easy. So. So in review, we'll look at a couple of the key dates as this uh, played out. Uh, June 18th, 2010, the, the new Heartbeat Extension RFC, that's just a request for comment. The guys got together and thought, hey, it would be a, a good idea to save time in negotiating this uh, encrypted channel. Let's find a way to do that. Here's what we're proposing. Um, and then it goes out to the technical community and they chop on it. and then they update, update it based on comments, and then they'll they move on to the next step. In December to 31st, 2011, it was merged into the main line of uh, code for OpenSSL after only uh, going through one code author and one reviewer. So there's potentially a breakdown there. Uh, interesting enough, back in June, uh, they, June 18th, 2010, when they first came out with the RFC, it does have specific language in the RFC that if uh, if the response from the heartbeat is too large, it is supposed to be discarded. Uh, obviously, that didn't make it into the final version of the code for whatever reason. March 14, 2012, uh, OpenSSL 1.01 was released. That was the first public release uh, of the version containing the vulnerable heartbeat code. So now we're looking at uh, March 14 to April 2014, nearly a little over two years, uh, this vulnerable this vulnerability was out there. So uh, right as of now, there are researchers and various other uh, universities out mining code that they have saved, looking for instances where this might have been um, exploited in the past. They haven't found any to date. Um, but certainly, it was possible uh, all the way back to March uh, 2012 when this first rolled out. April 7th, 2014. It was publicly announced, and then April 11th, a uh, security company called Cloudflare challenged the community to steal a private key from a honeypot. And for folks who don't know what a honeypot is, it's a uh, vulnerable server that's put out there for the sole purpose of attracting attackers. Um, usually they're deployed with inter interesting pieces of data that are typically useful to the, to the uh, user. Uh, useless to the to the corporation, but causes the attacker to spend his time digging through something that is not useful. Um, but in this case, it was a known vulnerable server with some private keys on there, and the challenge was, can you come up with the key to decrypt all traffic coming to and from the server? And as you can see, it was stolen within three hours of the challenge being uh, put out there. So it was a real uh, vulnerability and it was exploited uh, in a damaging way. Okay, so the vulnerability is out there. Everybody knows about it. Now, how do we recover? Obviously, prevention is the best. Uh, prevention is ideal. Um, but I think that, that uh, is past. Now, detection is a definite must. Um, and so in terms of detection, there are network signatures available. If you operate an IDS or an IPS um, intrusion detection system or intrusion protection system, there are signatures out there that will at least tell you that an attacker is trying to exploit this vulnerability on your network. Um, so this slide speaks to mostly uh, folks who do have server administration uh, or uh, security operations center type role. Uh, 
and we'll talk in the next couple of slides about what average users can do to protect themselves. But this one will focus mostly on uh, what you can do if, you, if it's your role's responsibility to protect the network. Obviously, um, once you get past detection, this shouldn't be your only medication technique because just because you know somebody is coming in and stealing your data doesn't solve the problem. So you want to upgrade or repair um, the OpenSSL version, the vulnerable version that you're running. You can upgrade to 1.01G uh, and fix the problem, or you can recompile the uh, previous version, just take out a couple of lines of code that operate the heartbeat extension or disallow heartbeats, uh, and that would solve the problem there. Uh, once the vulnerability has been patched, uh, you'll want to go ahead and replace all the private keys because you don't know, again, that if someone's come in and stolen those keys, you have to assume the worst and that they're gone. And so then you want to go ahead and replace all of those and then force all your users to reset the passwords. The key takeaway here, uh, again, is don't uh, do step three before you do uh, step one and two because uh, obviously if you don't plug the hole and the keys get stolen again, passwords and usernames, all that can be stolen again. So, uh, All right, so this gets to the heart of the briefing. Um, back a, a number of years ago, you might remember uh, a couple of these attacks. Um, public awareness was is pretty low, uh, typically, for these types of events, uh, unfortunately. And again, unfortunately, it takes one of these major events to get people's attention to, and then to a point where you can start talking about cybersecurity and how you fix some of these problems. Uh, you might have heard about Stuxnet um, or the Twitter hack uh, of, of Associated Press, or uh, worst of all, in my opinion, is, is China's New York Times hack. Um, but again, the lower the number here, the better. Unfortunately, you know, two-thirds of the people out there didn't know that China's, China even hacked the New York Times uh, or that the Associated Press Twitter account was hacked. Um, folks typically heard about Stuxnet, um, but, I, but this vulnerability, Heartbleed, is a, a different animal, I think, because Stuxnet was focused overseas and it was part of uh, the Defense Department's um, operation there. And it didn't really hit close to home to a lot of uh, average people here in the, in the States. And so uh, we do a comparison. Uh, it seems like a, a poll taken a week or two after the, the first release showed that 64% of Internet users were at least aware of Heartbleed. So that puts it on par with, with Stuxnet. And so uh, some indicators of that was Facebook saw a huge spike in people coming in and, and setting up two-factor authentication or uh, resetting passwords uh, just to be safe. Again, Facebook came out quickly and said we weren't vulnerable in the first place, but this is an indicator that it at least got people's attention. Uh, password management applications, for example, one password on the App Store, it jumped in the top ten instantly, so that's another indication that people were, were starting to listen and this was hitting close to home. And so it's a good opportunity if you have uh, people in your organization that you need to reach, this is a good starting point to, to open the conversation about security and start to communicate some of the best practices that we're going to go through in the next couple of slides. So heartbleed and the average user. So this, again, we talked about a couple of things you can do when uh, if you have a role of it. A security professional in your organization or a server administrator. Um, this is focused more on the average user, uh, home users, or what, what can you do to, to safeguard your information at home or even on the job. Uh, so first of all, you want to check the remediation status of the sites that you use. You know, USAA, for example, they, they came out really quickly and said, you know, we're safe. Um, it was unclear if they were vulnerable in the first place, but as, as an example, uh, they came out quickly and, and repaired their site. Uh, there were a number of sites out there as of mid-April that have not updated their, their use of OpenSSL, the vulnerable versions of it. And so uh, as an end user, you have very little control over, you know, the, have they updated their version, are they un invulnerable now? Um, but you do have uh, 
some control over going to their site in the first place. So there's various online checkers out there that you can use to put in the URL, the address of the site you want to visit, and you check to see if they're vulnerable. If they are, don't use the site. Uh, fairly simple. And if you need to use the site uh, and you're not sure if they've updated their, their um, software, uh, I always recommend calling the company. Believe me, they're getting hammered. It won't be anything new to have somebody call in and ask about Heartbleed. In fact, they probably have a canned response already. Uh, the second thing, there's a, uh, there's been several campaigns of Heartbleed themed spam where you'll have a link. Uh, now, it could be completely unrelated to Heartbleed, but again, it's captured the attention of folks and they're interested in, in learning ways to to keep their data safe and so they might be enticed to click on a on a website that promises uh, steps such as these that can that can protect their data. And again, then they, you, you get an infected computer and, and it does the exact opposite of what you're trying to do. So be aware of uh, spam that might um, use Heartbleed as a hook. Uh, the other part of that is uh, we talked about client-side vulnerabilities. Uh, it could be enticing you to a, a a server that the attacker has control of and can then issue heartbeat um, responses um, or requests to your local computer. Um, lower risk there, but, but still a, a possibility. Just be aware of that. Um, then you'll want to monitor your, your bank and credit card statements for unusual activity. There's a chance, obviously, that uh, your information might have been stolen, uh, the, the bank's private key could have been stolen and, and all of the uh, supposedly secured communication could have been decrypted and, and your information stolen. So you want to stay on top of that. If you see anything, contact your bank, obviously, and uh, begin the, the repair process for those. It's fairly straightforward. Reissue credit cards, change your password and all that. Uh, and then the last and one of the biggest things we have to control as end users in this area is to uh, change our passwords. And the best practice I, I find is to change it frequently. Um, quarterly is, is enough for most organizations. Obviously, the, the more you do it, the more painful it is uh, because you've got to stay on top of it. But again, uh, you'll be more secure because if, a, if an attacker is able to steal your password, uh, it won't work for very long. And the chances are greater for you to be secure and, then, and, and not be exploited in that manner. So. I've listed a few uh, do's and don'ts here for passwords. Obviously, you want to change them. We, we talked about that frequently. Uh, mixed lower and uppercase numbers and special characters. I know there are some sites out there that restrict on, on what you're able to do, but in those cases, uh, substitute the, the special characters if they don't allow them with, with extra length on the password. I wouldn't use any, any password less than 10 characters, and you'll want to, again, mix it up. Uh, using upper and lower and, and specials and numbers. Uh, don't reuse them on other sites. This is key because um, I just read yesterday that uh, there's a uh, the website uh, sensationalized it a little bit and said that there's a hacker out there locking people's iPads and iPhones and demanding ransom in order to unlock them. Um, at first it captured my attention because I thought, well, is there a new uh, iPhone or iPad vulnerability out there that's being exploited? exploited? Uh, after digging in, it seems that um, all that happened is uh, the attacker is taking advantage of the remote lock or track my iPhone or track my iPad feature where you can log in using your Apple ID and username and password and, uh, and remotely locking it out. It's a functionality that Apple built in that supposedly is supposed to secure your, your device if it gets lost or stolen, but in this case it's being uh, used to uh, demand ransom for use, and it seems like the root cause of this is lost username and password to the Apple ID to your Apple ID. Um, could it be related to Heartbleed? I guess it could. Uh, if um, let's say your your username and password was stolen from a vulnerable site, and then you reused that on multiple sites, um, they they wouldn't be able to access your account. So, good rule of thumb: don't reuse your accounts, your passwords on, on multiple different sites. And, and to avoid this, and this is where it gets a little controversial, some people don't agree with me, but if you have good physical security in your location, if it's in your house and you can lock it up and you're, you're okay with 
nobody coming in and stealing it. You can keep a list of passwords and sites and usernames written down so you just keep track of that. Obviously, if you don't have control of uh, the, your physical surroundings, if you're at work and you keep it in your QB or in your drawer, you wouldn't want to do something like that. But, uh, you know, at home, the risk of somebody breaking in and stealing your password book is, is probably lower than um, the risk to you of using multiple different passwords and and, uh, and forgetting them and then potentially ex uh, exposing them and using a mistake that you might make. So I recommend writing them down at home in a safe place. And then don't use names of people, especially family members, pets, and friends because uh, Attackers are well aware of usually of who the end user are. If they have your your password or have your username or your email or anything about you, they can they can collect it via social media these days. Just scrape a bunch of names off of your Facebook page and put them into a program that generates passwords based on uh, key key words from your social network, uh, and then they'll brute force your password. So again, don't don't use family members, pets, or friends, or anything else that is out there for an attacker that they can scrape up and, and use. And, uh, and here's some resources that you can use if you want to know more about the Heartbleed vulnerability. Heartbleed.com is kind of the, the main site that was set up just after the announcement, and it has a bunch of information about how you can upgrade and, and safeguard your servers and, and the progress that's being made in that area. US CERT. They have a Heartbleed Vulnerability Alert site that lists all of the vulnerable applications and sites that are, that are still out there. I think they keep that up to date fairly well. Um, then we mentioned the tools that you can use at home to test if a site is vulnerable before you visit it. Uh, you put the URL in or the, the address and hit check, and it's that simple. It says, uh, this, is, this is a vulnerable site, do not use, or you're okay. Um, if you want to do it manually, there's some Python code out there, um, heartbleed.py and pacemaker.py that, that uh, researchers have developed to scan your internal servers if you want to do it from a command line, if you're able to do that. And then uh, some information about the recovery. Uh, there are a couple of sites out there that are keeping track of the top uh, one, one million domains and, and how they've been remediated or not. I think they keep that up to date pretty well. So if you go out there and you see a site that you'd like to frequent and it's on the list, you might want to think about uh, not going there until they get that get their site fixed. So that's about it. Uh, we talked about Heartbleed. We talked about um, the genesis of the vulnerable code, and we talked about some things that you can do as an end user to uh, mitigate, for the most part, the exposure of your data. We talked about a couple of things now that folks are listening that you can uh, go and have a conversation with them about uh, best practices on the internet, mostly passwords in this context, passwords and uh, visiting sites that, uh, that may be vulnerable. So I think we're going to move into a question okay. and answer. Well, thank you, Aaron, very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, I have, let me ask the first question though. I mean. How is it that such a simple bug was never discovered? I mean, this seems to be programming, poor coding, programming practice 101 that this problem ever existed in, especially in an open source environment. Um, do you have any right. thoughts as to why this was never this was never caught in the first place? Right. That's a good point. Uh, you know, there's you could say something about Monday morning quarterbacking or, or whatnot. Uh, but certainly. it's a common it's a common bug that there that everybody. Right. Knows about from a, security, from a security perspective, it's you know it's for years, and right? And there's a number of tools that you can use to check your code, and they're automated, and you run it through, and and it checks and says, hey, here's here's a place where you don't do some bounds checking. Um, why the why the uh, creator didn't do that, uh, I do not know. And, and and why somebody else didn't find it, you know, given and that it's open. It, it, I, we we talked about it, went through one reviewer and and, and one author, so maybe the. The limited exposure. We talked about the RFC that did go out widely, and it had um, a caveat in there about uh, avoiding this type of scenario. It didn't make it into the code for whatever reason. Um, there's uh, conspiracy theorists, obviously, talking about you know, did they did they work with somebody to keep this in there? Who knows? Oh, I see. Yeah, right, right. Okay, oh. very good, very good. Okay. Um, 
let's see. So we, I have uh, four or five questions here also from the audience. Um, the first one being, the Heartbleed vulnerability highlights one of the challenges with using open source code. Do we need to think the use of open source? Open source code appears here to stay. What can we do to improve the security? Excellent question. So um, in my opinion, open source is the way to go because for the most part, if you think about it, it gets exposed to, to more people, the innards of a, a program. So it's all out there for anybody to take a look at and, and to hammer on and you know, ideally these things get caught. In fact, something like this was caught eventually, took two years, but it was caught because people were able to go in and see the code. Now, when you talk about closed source or proprietary coding, it's sometimes, you know, once it's compiled, it's hard to go in and, and reverse engineer the exact functions. Um, so it's a lot tougher to, to, to find vulnerabilities in this manner. There are ways to do it, even automated ways, but still it's, it's, it's more difficult than going in and having source code and being able to run some of these vulnerability tools against the source. So, you know, from that regard, I think it's better to be uh, more open and have the community be able to hammer on it than it is to be closed. Uh, talk about, you know, Adobe comes to mind or something like that where you know, it's fraught with vulnerabilities and, and it could probably benefit from some, some community uh, scrutiny. Does that kind of answer the question? I did, it does, yes. Okay, uh, this one question is maybe uh, you can elaborate. If FIPS mode is enabled in um, is OpenSSL still vulnerable? Uh, no, I think um, I think I read something uh, soon after it was released that it was either not vulnerable in the first place or they were able to uh, get it patched right away. And I'm, I'm wanting to say that it was a it was using a previous version, not 1.01, .01, but previous, so it wouldn't have been vulnerable. So I don't have exact details, but I do faintly remember that there was there's no issue there now. Okay, okay, very good. Um, this one wanted you to explain again how the hacker bypasses or extends the three-character secure code, like HAT, to gather the additional information in server memory. Okay, so it's not something you're going to be able to do from, uh, from GUI uh, space. So you're not going to be able to, you're going to have to open up um, maybe code on a, a script or something that, and I supplied uh, in the resources section some scripts that you can download. But you can manipulate the, the packets on the wire to essentially say, okay, I'm, I want this response from you, and it is 500 characters long or it is two characters long. And so once the server receives that, it looks at what you want to have returned. It doesn't check to make sure that it matches the length, and it just grabs whatever length off of the stack, the memory stack on the server, and supplies that back to the to the requester. Um, right. The simplest case from the comic that, that we showed was uh, somebody asked for hat. Well, that's three characters, but they lied and said it was, you know, 500 characters, and so it grabbed all of that off the stack and, and supplied hat. Certainly got that back, but it got a lot more than that because it was was if you ask for a longer amount. And again, you'll have to script that out and uh, or download the, the scripts that were provided in this uh, briefing. Okay, very good. Um, was the NSA, or maybe even the Chinese too, aware of this vulnerability before it was announced to the public? Yeah, it's hard to say. The NSA had some bad press uh, last year, as we all know, and so they were quick to jump out soon after this was released and say, we found out about it just like everybody else did. And when we when when everybody else did, uh, I mentioned that there are institutions out there doing some digging around on on old network captures that they have, trying to discover uh, potential attackers using this before it was announced. I don't think they've found that yet. Maybe a, maybe one example, but it could have been something else. Uh, so it's not a definitive smoking gun. Um, whether the Chinese knew about it or not, um, again, nobody knows for sure nobody because knows. they haven't. Right. Haven't found instances, and that's the worst part about it because it's not natively logged. Um, certainly, there's signatures that you can deploy on your network now, but that's not going to help you um, to, over the last two years. So, uh, unknown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. 
Is there a recognized legal responsibility for a website to maintain security? In other words, who is liable, liable if a vulnerability such as this one isn't removed? Yeah, well, that's a that's a hardball question. So that you know, that's something that's being negotiated, and even up in Congress now, uh, you know, who's who's liable? The, the lawyers are all getting together. Certainly, um, take an example like Target uh, recently that they exposed their customers' data to a, to an attacker, and you know, does does Target go to court for that? I don't know if the laws have been fleshed out for that yet, but uh, certainly a hot topic in in Congress nowadays, and and amongst Security professionals is who's liable now. It matters at the end of the day who who gets the finger for that because um, that that plays into the you know the, the risk and the the business. You know, do we get internet insurance now as a company, um, and how much do, you know should we get, and what's that mean from from a risk mitigation perspective? So definitely worth following that that discussion as it gets finalized. I see. I see. Um... Let's see. I think the last question is: Does Mozilla have a better track record than OpenSSL in this regard? He's referring to Mozilla NSS. Um, well, certainly, uh, this particular vulnerability is, uh, is is right up there at the top of the list. I, and I've heard of any OpenSSL vulnerabilities, at least of this magnitude, uh, since its inception, you know, nearly you know, over 10 years ago. So as far as track records go, and I haven't heard any of Mozilla. Of course, I haven't done the research. Um, I would say that there, it's still useful as a as a SSL implement, implementation tool. Um, as far as comparison, I would say they're they're probably comparable. But mm -hmm. I mean, there are other options out there, uh, open, uh, you know, open source even uh, that you can that you can lean on. But you know, it's it's one of those things. Software has vulnerabilities, and from time to time they get discovered. And uh, bad things happen. So. Right, right, right. Um, back to my initial question about why did this ever happen in the first place? One of the attendees is saying that there was has been no negative testing done, um, never tested by testers, tested by developers. He thinks that it's not a slam on developers. It's the fact that developers look at it. Is, is their code working not? What does my code do that it's not supposed to do? And I think that's very true. That's yep, that's, the way that's a common problem. The common problem of developers. So, yep. so anyways, okay. Well, I, I think that's that's it um, in terms of the um, um, major questions. Some people are looking for other more resources and stuff like that, and I'll pass that on to you, Aaron, to respond to. Uh, yep. But anyways, I thank you again very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, um, we had a good attendance today, and so I, I, I think it, and most of the people have stuck around, so I think that speaks well to your presentation, and so we thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to everybody coming back to another CISIAC presentation next month. All right, well, thanks again, Aaron. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye now.